The image of the dancer in the Caledonia Victims Project logo was a tribute to a 14-year-old girl named Pam Dudich who loved to dance before her world turned upside down. Pam lives on the sixth line in Caledonia. The OPP withdrew policing from her street on April 20th, 2006, after hundreds of native occupiers attacked them while they were trying to enforce a court order. Police were injured after being attacked with clubs, crowbars, axes, a chainsaw, and socks filled with rocks. And before I go on, I just want to tell you that all of these, all of the evidence, all the citations for every fact that I'm reciting tonight is going to be at helplessbyblatchford.ca and you'll be able to download all the documents yourself. It's on your program. The court order was supposed to end an illegal occupation of a new subdivision across the street from Pam's house, known as the Douglas Creek Estates, which began on February 28, 2006. Lawlessness escalated over time as it became clear to the occupiers that they were immune from the law. The worst of the violence occurred after May 3, 2006, when the former Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services, Monty Quinter, acceded to the militant's demand not to call in the Canadian forces to protect Caledonia. That's his letter that he sent. So far, Native protesters have burned down a bridge and threatened to kill firefighters, attacked an elderly couple in their car, attacked journalists, assaulted and threatened residents, police, and one another, destroyed the area's hydro station, thrown a vehicle over a bridge, blocked the town's main roads and rail lines, attempted to murder a police officer, polluted the environment with tire and grass fires, extorted money from non-native landowners, and left a builder with permanent brain damage after beating him nearly to death in the home he was building for his daughter. In 2007, the CBC produced a documentary based on the thousand plus hours of audio recordings of radio transmissions in our possession, proving that occupiers had actually authorized the shooting of civilians and police, among other depravities. It was pulled half an hour before it aired, and the CBC still refuses to air it. We first met Pam Dudich and her family in March 2007. She produced a heartbreaking pamphlet for a school project. She called it Road of Hope, Help the Sixth Line. And she wanted, and her family wanted the world to hear her words of pain. So we took her to Queen's Park to share her story at his news conference. Not a single journalist interviewed her afterwards. For 14 years, I've been living on this road, and that's how long I've been alive. But only 13 years have been happy years. Ever since February 28, 2006, my whole life changed. Having to be almost literally locked inside my own home, I was terrified to even look out my own window. Close your eyes and imagine. You're looking out your own laundry room window, and you see the tall, beautiful oak trees on your neighbor's property. But when you look higher up, you see the darkest, biggest bloom of smoke you've ever seen. You run into the living room to look out that window and find almost 50 cars lining up and down your streets, with natives walking everywhere. They're pulling in your driveway, not even on the right side of the road. You even see a 12-year-old driving a car past, but you can't do anything. You can't call the police because they can't help you. You're locked in your own home. A few days later, when it calms down, you have to go to school. But you can't get to school by bus anymore. You have to drive a 30-minute ride to school when it only took two minutes unless you went through the blockade. But you could only do this if you had a pass. But even when we got one, it was whether they felt like letting you through or not. If they did let you go, it was like you're in prison. Gates were everywhere. Men with masks over, the, over their faces, only to see their eyes. Men holding bats, some even with guns. It was a living hell. I had to live through that. You don't know what life is like until you have to live through it. I'm a competitive dancer, and I love to dance outside on the side lawn. But I wasn't able to, to do it unless I could make 
take the pressure of getting stares or firecrackers thrown at me. Now I take medication and go to counseling because of all this. A 14-year-old should not be doing this. It's these things that hurt, because it's not just my family in pain, it's all of ours on the sixth line. There are seven children on this road, ranging from 10 months to 15 years old. It's very sad when the 14 and 15-year-old are told that if ever a native came into our house, and tried hurting us and we defended ourselves by fighting back, we would be the ones being arrested, not the NATO. People in Caledonia think it's quiet on the sixth line, but they have it all wrong. It's nothing like that. People on the sixth line have not had a good night's sleep for over a year now. That's sad. This is why we need your help. I'm 14 years old and I will fight with as much power as I have to get police back on my road. I know Mr. Peterson made the mistake of tr taking it away and said and it's sad when he can't fix it on his own, but I, a 14-year-old girl, is trying. Thank you. <clears throat> I am asked to take medication to go to counsel. We'll talk about that later. Pam's mother showed me the pass that natives force them to carry, as well as a photo of, the, of two of the seven deer carcasses hung by occupiers on a lamp pole near their home between October and December 2006, where kids on the school bus could see them. Her diary entry for October 30th at 3.50 p.m. notes this about the fifth carcass. Quote, between yesterday at 1.30 and now, the deer was taken down, skinned, and beheaded, and then hung back up. Mayor called. Quote, her mom wrote me saying, quote, seeing the deer each time gave you a sickening feeling in your gut. Another Caledonia resident, resident asked me to share one of his experiences. Quote, the police and firemen were hiding behind my fence while a group of natives, brackets, terrorists, were lighting a fire, were lighting a fire behind my house. They said to my neighbor and myself, we cannot protect you or touch them. We were and are still treated as shit by the police. My trust in our system is gone forever. OPP testimony at the trial for the Brown Chapwell lawsuit, which was heard, and later cited by Christy Blatchford in Helpless, confirms the Haldeman OPP commander was ordered not to arrest rioting natives who he said were emboldened by the lack of police response. Residents were forced to stand guard one night at the home of a 92-year-old World War II veteran named Jack Nancy because OPP officers refused to stop native occupiers from throwing rocks at his house. And you're going to hear from a speaker, the former mayor of Haldeman tonight. She was there that night, and she saw it with her own eyes. This war hero later showed me one of the rocks and cheerfully told me, quote, I spent five years in hell for this country, and now I don't even know if the police will protect me. It wasn't worth it. In 2010, Pam's mother shared her feelings about the return of the OPP to the Sixth Line. Four years, four years after they were abandoned by their police. Hmm. Quote, We've lost four years of our lives, which we will never get back. I feel like Canada has let us down big time. For a land that is supposed to be free, we are prisoners of war who have been left to deal with this predicament on our own. As for policing back down here, yes, it's true. Do we feel any safer? No. False accusations of being white supremacists are common against non-native victims and activists including for this event. Intimidation has also included physical assaults and death and torture threats. This charming cartoon here is typical. Are you white? Are you a complete failure? Do you want to avoid responsibility for your failure? Then citizens of Caledonia become a white supremacist. The guy on the left says, I'm a bigot, I hate Indians. And the guy with the swastika on his chest says, Duh, my mom is white, Caledonia is white. December 2007, the former OPP commissioner was photographed sharing a joke with the native man who led the attack. But he refused, refused, Mayor Trainer's September 2009 request to meet with the Six Line residents, which would have included Pam Dudich's family. 
Four non-natives have been arrested for trying to raise a Canadian flag near the occupation site. I'm one of them. Um, three of them are actually two of them here. Uh, a Caledonia resident, a police officer, who criticized Ontario's Premier faced a Police Services Act charge after a government negotiator complained to the OPP, who in turn filed a complaint with the Hamilton Police Service. It was held to be unfounded. In Mr. McHale's case, the OPP repeatedly targeted him for defamation and false arrests, a campaign that resulted in charges of obstructing justice against the present commissioner and a superintendent, and a charge of influencing a municipal official against the former commissioner, Fantina. OPP officers have even visited hall owners to intimidate them into cancelling room rental agreements so we could not speak. It is difficult to convey to you the absolute terror, the hopelessness, trauma, and sense of betrayal the people of Caledonia feel to this day. Perhaps it's enough to tell you that Pam Dudich must take medication and go to counseling. Pam's mother takes medication for her diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder and has attempted suicide. Pam's father has had a heart attack. The family business is in ruins and they can't leave because they can't sell their home. <coughs> this sign is from the Sterling Street subdivision where native occupiers burned down the bridge and left Sam Beltier with brain damage from their vicious beating. The words heartless and cruel seem inadequate to describe the irony of a situation wherein an organized group from one race of people terrorized others with racial slurs, fire, violence, vandalism, and property seizures, and then, and then, tormented their victims with false accusations of being white supremacists. As the son of parents who lived in Nazi-occupied Holland, I am offended to the very core of my being by the blaming of innocent victims for racially motivated crimes against them. I am also offended that Six Nations people have also been unintended victims of the same racist policing policies that allow illegal occupations to escalate and the sites to become lawless, quote, home-free zones, as residents in Caledonia and Hipperwash refer to them. Occupation sites have been, have been seen rapes, assaults, arson, drug use, and gun violence. A Six Nations newspaper confirmed that the shooter of a, a Six Nations man at a nearby smoke shack had been on the occupation site near the homes of residents threatening another over a drug debt with an AK-47 rifle just prior to the shooting. A resident went out and notified an OPP officer, but he refused to enter the site, and a native man was later shot in the arm when he emptied his magazine. In August 2007, another Six Nations paper cited former Six Nations Chief David General's opinion that, quote, he does not consider the occupation site sacred land, citing two reported rapes and several other unseemly acts which have been reported from the reclamation site, unquote. In both Ipperwash and Caledonia, ironically, original occupiers have expressed fear over the lawlessness that developed in the aftermath of their own lawless takeovers. So where do we go from here? This drawing, which we first presented in September 2008 to Brantford Council and later to the OPP, is in your handout, it's on page two. It's called Reconciliation, the Canning's Path. We must commit to a path of truth, justice, and apology from Six Nations, from the OPP and the Ontario government. There are no shortcuts. There are no alternatives. If the government of Canada can, rightly, apologize for residential schools, then these groups can apologize for Caledonia. Unfortunately, five months after the release of Helpless, the present OPP commissioner has not even read the book, nor has the Haldeman Detachment Committee. As we finally begin to talk about victims and solutions, we must also acknowledge that those who terrorize Caledonia do not, do not, represent the good people of Six Nations or Aboriginal people in general. Thank you. That's the end of part one. Question periods at the end. Thank you.